Okay, I have a question and answer for you this morning. And the question for you, and, and um, unfortunately with uh, not having live comments online, uh, y'all in the sanctuary have to answer me here. Um, give me, who does New Year's resolutions? No. Excellent. Good answer. Oh, Paul kind of does. The optimists. The optimists. Oh, yeah. I don't mean the optimists, but optimists. Right. Not the optimist club, although they might. You don't know. Um, but yeah, optimists do New Year's resolutions. Why, why is it optimists that do New Year's resolutions? Well, they, they think it might make a difference. They think it might make a difference. The triumph of hope over experience. The triumph of hope over experience. Yeah. That's also a <laughs> now, why don't New Year's resolutions make a difference, pessimists? And like, I, I enjoy how everybody here on January 2nd is a pessimist. Why don't New Year's resolutions work? Because we are people. Oh, so Deb thinks we're realists. At least some of us are realists, okay. So, okay, so why don't, why don't New Year's resolutions work in your experience? You would have done it before if you really thought it was important. Oh, if you really thought it was important, you would have done it before. So what is so special about the Earth being in this particular spot in its orbit that changes whether or not this is important enough to you? Okay. Well, the, the resolutions are unrealistic most of the time. Resolutions are unrealistic most of the time, the particular resolutions that we make. Okay, yeah, so, so we are like shooting the moon with our resolutions and it doesn't always work. <laughs> oh, we have an optimist. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's, if it mattered enough to us, we would have done it already. Um, the thing that we think we're going to do is so big that we can't possibly do it, at least not right now, right? Who feels like maybe your New Year's resolutions would go better if they were like June resolutions? <laughs> Personally, and maybe this is just because uh, December is always an extra busy month for me, January always feels like maybe a, a bigger bite to chew, uh, in terms of changing uh, whatever habit it was that I was going to change. And now that winter has started, there's a lot of winter left uh, for those of us. Y'all online, I don't even know where you are. So you may not be experiencing winter, but here in Iowa, winter. And at the same time, there is this, you know, there is something in the way that we begin something, right? The way that we start, whether it's a new year, a new uh, relationship, a new project, something about the way that we start does make a difference, and yet there is so much left to go after that. We are at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in our scripture reading this morning. Uh, so if you were here last week, and y'all were, I'm pretty sure, um, so, if you were here last week, uh, we met Jesus. We had Jesus pointed out to us uh, from a distance by uh, John the Baptist, who was another religious leader uh, just prior to Jesus. And John's uh, mission, according to the Gospel of John, was to point to Jesus. That was his whole job. So, John has pointed to Jesus, but we haven't heard anything from him yet, but we're about to. We're going to hear the beginning of, of Jesus' out loud spoken ministry, and we're going to uh, read the beginning of the discipleship journeys of four or five of Jesus' first disciples. So to begin, uh, will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, Show us the word made flesh, good news of great joy for all, so that we may sing with the angels glory in the highest and peace on earth 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God! The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was afraid that one of you here in the room where we can hear you was going to tell me something really good about New Year's resolutions, but instead you all had the expected answer. So uh, y'all at home, if you are super New Year's resolution people, good on you. I'm not. And really, a, a big piece of the reason that I'm not is, as we described, it's, it's usually too big an ask, and uh, it's usually something that if I were going to make that change, I would have made it by now, or it's the kind of change that is going to take some time. It's going to take a little bit of process to get from where I am to where I'm going, which is actually why I'm thinking this morning not so much about New Year's resolutions, but I'm thinking about those experiences that get you from where you were to where you are now, and particularly those, those faith experiences that get you from where you were to where you are now, or got you from where you used to were to where you were after that, and maybe you've had more experiences uh, before now. So I want to invite you um, to just think a little bit about those experiences that changed your faith, particularly those experiences that you had as an adult that have changed your faith. Uh, so not the very beginning, right? But the things that have shifted you since then. Maybe it was a time that you hit bo rock bottom and just had nowhere else to go. Or maybe it was a pilgrimage that you went on, whether or not you recognized before you got there that the place you were going was holy. Or maybe it was a time that illness threatened either your body or your mind or your relationships. I'm thinking about that because our life of faith, well, it has a beginning. For some of us, the beginning was a very, very long time ago. But it also has these moments when something changes, this process of transformation that goes on within us and around us. 
Today's scripture reading is like a New Year's resolution gone bad kind of scripture reading. It describes this beginning that is just almost too good to be true. We are there with John the Baptist, who has some disciples, and he identifies Jesus as the one that he's been waiting for, and immediately the disciples go off to Jesus, right? And not only do they immediately go follow Jesus, but they immediately know everything about him. Did you notice that? So last week we met John, uh, who was this uh, religious leader whose job was to set the stage for Jesus, and the, uh, religious, the other religious authorities sent a delegation out to meet with John and said, who the heck are you and what are you doing? And John says, I'm here to point the way to someone I don't even know until I saw this dove descend from heaven and land on him, and now I know that this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John knows everything. And today, John hands off to Jesus his first two disciples. Jesus' first two disciples. And then some. So there's Andrew and his friend. We never get to know the friend. Um, and then Andrew goes and finds his brother Simon, and then the next day we meet Philip, and Philip finds Nathaniel, and they say, we have found the Messiah, we've found the one about whom Moses and the prophets wrote, just like John the Baptist knew everything he needed to know last week by immediate revelation, so do these first disciples. Now, this story, this is testimony, not evidence. Jewish readers in particular uh, usually don't think that the Torah and the prophets point clearly to Jesus of Nazareth. Instead, there's, a, there's an interpretive choice that we have to make in order to read those stories as pointing ahead to this story. And I call your attention to that because that's a, a way of noticing that these statements, that statement Moses and the prophets wrote about this guy. That's an interpretive choice that kicks off a whole different story. This is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. That kicks off a whole different story. Kicks off a story that will only make sense if we read through that lens that already knows who Jesus is. Andrew and Philip, they have this detailed information about Jesus right off the bat. And that's unique. That is unique to the way that John tells this story. I will try not to always point out when John messes with the other stories, but today I think this matters. Uh, you'll remember that the Bible has these four different distinct accounts of Jesus' life. And that was not the only choice the Bible could have made. The Bible could have made the choice to take these four stories of Jesus' life and work them together just into one story that we would take just as one thing. But that's not the Bible we have. The Bible we have gives us these four different distinct accounts of Jesus' life so that the differences between these stories can invite us to reflect more deeply and find Jesus in the world in different ways today. So Matthew and Mark and Luke, they tell stories that follow a very similar pattern, and they show how the disciples fail and learn along the way, and nobody, no human being in any of those Gospels calls Jesus the Messiah until halfway through the story, which is a lot more like my experience, which is a lot more like most of our experiences, where we get started, but eventually we figure out why it is we're doing what we're doing. John tells us a different kind of story, and he gives us this really remarkable thing where the disciples, well, they will falter and stumble along the way, but they are never, even for a moment, in the dark about who Jesus is. Because believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that's just where the story begins. Believing that Jesus is the Messiah is just where the story begins in this gospel. And so, again, understanding and believing, well, they matter, but they are just the beginning of this journey that we call faith. Jesus answers Nathanael, do you believe just because I told you I saw you under a tree? You are going to see much greater things than these. 
these four or five disciples and all the rest who follow them will see great things. They will see water become wine. They will see a sack lunch become a feast because when God provides, life is filled with abundance. They'll see water and compassion shared across lines of gender and ethnicity and propriety because God gathers together a community that is much bigger, greater, and more diverse than we could possibly imagine. These disciples will see the Holy Spirit fill the church so that we too can heal and forgive because Jesus won human life 2,000 years ago. That is not God's only presence in the world. These disciples will see a community of faith that spreads along trade routes, in sick houses, in impoverished neighborhoods, in prisons, and in barracks. They will see this community of faith, this community of eternal life, as John will call it. They'll see it spread among those who most need to be set free in this world. And we see those great things, too, when we know that faith is not the end of the journey, but the beginning, that the Messiah, the promised one, is still leading us into life. So that's why I invited you to wonder just a little bit about those experiences that changed your faith. Those experiences that weren't the beginning of the story, you might also be able to tell the beginning of the story, but those experiences that changed and grew and stretched your faith. Here's someone else's experience. This is Jack, who just found Jesus all over again. Jack grew up steeped in that American brand of Christianity, the one that has all the right answers and what you need to do is know all the right answers, the one that taught Jack as a young man that good men lead their household and provide for their families and teach their children to do the same thing, which did also teach Jack to seek Jesus as his source of community and purpose. And that's what makes those answers the beginning of a faith story. Well, well into his adulthood, Jack went to a church convention near the U.S.-Mexico border. And on a free afternoon, he was up hiking in the mountains and found empty water bottles and discarded clothing and crosses planted in the dirt. He saw evidence of the poverty and violence and despair that are present there at that border. And it almost broke him to try to hold that knowledge alongside Jesus' call to welcome the stranger. He realized how policies and theologies had worked together to put people like Jack himself at the center of the story and harm others along the way. And it did break him. It broke his heart, and it rebirthed his faith. And he moved into a tradition that, instead of continuing to build up a, a world with him at the center of it, it, it built up a world with Jesus, the one who was on the margins at the center of it. He moved into a tradition that pulls down structures of exclusion and violence and he began living into that commitment to inclusion, living into a commitment to service for those who are broken, a commitment to seeing Jesus' glory in everyday, ordinary life. Because his story wasn't over at the beginning. It was only beginning. And it continues now. So this year, and whatever... Uh, whatever this new beginning means as we stand here on the second day of the year, I pray that we can also come to see greater things and that our lives with Jesus will grow and change and reveal God's presence to us in this world more and more. Amen. I invite you to... Our moment for mission lifts up our January Coins for Concern partner, the Des Moines Area Religious Council. Your loose change in the offering plate this month will go to support this vital mission. 
At DMARC, faith communities come together to help meet our neighbors' need for affordable, nutritious food. We collect for DMARC in January because we know that food shelves are often running low after the holidays and demand is always high. This month, leaders at DMARC expect food insecurity to rise even faster than usual as pandemic emergency relief programs come to an end. CEO uh, Matt Unger told the Des Moines Register, it's scary to think that the worst is still in front of us for what we do. So your contributions will help to offset rising demand and increases in freight and food costs. It has always been the case that DMARC can purchase food more economically than you or I can, and so our cash donations are more important than ever. Thank you for your contributions to Coins for Concern this month.